Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, as Klaas said, I'm an urban designer. I've been trained as an urban designer in Venezuela, in Caracas, and one of the few schools that actually uh, offers ur urban design without being an architect. So it's not that I'm, I've, I've been choosing to be not named an architect. I've been trained uh, literally as urban designer. Um, during the last 11 years, I've been, um, I've been involved in the growth of, of IAC the Institute uh, for Advanced Architecture of Catalonia. Uh, the, you have seen some of my colleagues here uh, that are also presenting papers and projects. And, and in, in, let's say, in focus, I've been uh, at EAC, uh, involved from the very beginning uh, in the establishment of the Fabla Barcelona, uh, one of the first uh, digital fabrication laboratories, or uh, open digital fabrication laboratories in the European Union, uh, which actually uh, this year uh, turned 10, 10 years old. And, and I wanted to start with that, to start with, to mention you, mentioning you some of the projects I've been involved during the last, these last 10 years, um, since I am not uh, specifically entangled with this community as, as other people, and, and, and that will help somehow to uh, contextualize uh, the work that I'm going to talk about. Um, so that same year, uh, I took with two MIT students a mobile fab lab, and we went to Burning Man uh, in, uh, in Nevada, which you know is a temporary city uh, that tr now turned into the, the kind of a, um, so oh, sorry, uh, kind of a, the um, a amusement park of Silicon Valley. But back then, it was a pre-iPhone uh, uh, kind of era. It was was pretty unique. And then you could have people in the lab using the machines that you use in your lab, but actually turn, while having acid or tripping in acid, for instance. No? So it was pretty fun as a first experience uh, with, with digital fabrication under in that uh, context. Um, uh, just uh, the one year after, um, uh, um, I was deeply involved in the fabrication and installation of this uh, installation we did in, uh, in the Venice Biennale. This was a project led by Vicente Wallart. Uh, and we basically took 300 square meters and we fill it with uh, uh, plexiglass uh, um, representations of, of, of six um, uh, habitat units. Uh, and, and each one of the, uh, the objects had embedded a, a Internet Zero or, or Internet of Things uh, devices. No? So that allow us to connect every single object with the other and also exchange scales of it uh, and trying to simulate what happens when I open my fridge and I take uh, something out of it. What is, what, what is the effect that it's going to have in a larger scale in the supply chain of a city, for instance? Um, a couple of years after, and, and, and uh, you know, uh, I've seen Xavier and Jonathan around, uh, we, we organized at EAC uh, the Smart Geometry Conference that, 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 signif uh, that was actually a big transition in the, smart, uh, in the Smart Geometry Conference from being just a computer led. Uh, or computer design led uh, conference to actually to have this experimentation and fabrication um, uh, let's say experience within the the whole smart geometry and I, and I was in charge together with Luis Fraguada of running the whole that was the, the fabrication lab during that week and it was pretty crazy and, and also at the same time pretty exciting to have all these talented people around uh, and which we learn from uh, that same year even if we, we had enough we didn't have enough with with smart geometry with uh, produce uh, one of uh, uh, well one of the first um, um, self sufficient and, and solar prototypes in Barcelona, which was the Fab Lab House for the Solar Decathlon competition, and, and, and was a house that could be entirely produced in a, in a lab, and actually that we released uh, the files to be downloaded and made anywhere. Uh, few years after, uh, we organized the 10th Fab Lab conference in Barcelona, which gathered the, the international Fab Lab community when we opened in 2000. Uh, seven, the Fab Lab community was about 10 Fab Labs uh, in total. Nowadays, it's 1,000, near 1,200. By that time, near 500 labs all coming to Barcelona. And we, we had a week also of workshops and, and large scale production of installations like, like this uh, solar condenser uh, that we did in collaboration with Margen Lab. A uh, few years after, and this is one of the most recent projects in our lab, uh, we had our neighbors. Um, from Leca Restaurant, it's a, two, it's a restaurant two blocks from our, from our, from our laboratory, and they came to us uh, to ask us for recommendations of 
how they can improve their, their restaurant. It was like a 25 years old or a greasy, very homemade food. And, uh, and they were basically trying to modernize the restaurant. And we conceptualized, designed, and produced the restaurant. So it's a zero kilometer restaurant. Uh, because uh, actually we produce things next door and we bring it and all, actually all the furniture and all, uh, all the menu and even the garments that the, that the staff uses are open source and downloadable in the, in the website of a restaurant itself. No? So we are trying to promote this idea of bringing local fabrication or, or, or bringing fabrication more local through the project Fab City which is actually a project I'm going to uh, um, probably explain to you in depth uh, later on. But that brings somehow uh, the approach and uh, uh, somehow my approach that I have been constructing di during these years and trying to both mix the idea of urban design with the, the available digital technologies and how these uh, uh, both together can transform cities. Now from the perspective of, of uh, I would say, of a philosophy that it's not really new. No? So this idea of that cities can be produced by the citizens um, is something that uh, you know, has been in our minds not only uh, 50 years ago, but even before with the work of Otto Neurath, for instance, at the beginning of the last century. So uh, this idea of, of people producing the city is something that probably uh, back then was more idealistic, but nowadays you start to see that uh, we are becoming producers of, well, of content uh, than never before, right? So only in a transition of 20, 25 years, uh, we have been enabled with new tools, this has been said before, but actually, uh, this is not just about being able to pull content, but actually being able to push content, content uh, to the internet. And I think that that's pretty significant when you bring it to the, to the physical world as well. Uh, and, and, and the availability of technology, not only in the digital realm, but now in the physical realm, and, and, and also the, in, in using tools that allow both to interact, for instance, like uh, low-cost devices to enable Internet of Things uh, networks, or uh, digital fabrication labs that are open and available for everyone, as I say, and growing, and growing exponentially. And what to say, the uh, plastic extruders, aka uh, 3D printers. No? So um, the, what, what, what is interesting for me also is trying to understand how uh, you know, the big technology transformations have produced a new way of understanding uh, society. You know? And this is a... This is a, a, a table that I just reproduced from, from ShareLab, which I highly recommend to check, in which um, we can see somehow, uh, you know, some people talk about three industrial revolutions, some people talk about five industrial revolutions, but in this sense, I think that uh, when we talk about societies, uh, it's true that uh, around a dozen thousand years ago, agriculture transformed the way we live dramatically, you know? And, uh, and I recently read uh, uh, um, a really interesting sentence which, say, which says, like, uh, you know, if we think that we domesticated plants, we're wrong. Actually, plants dom domesticated us because we started to cultivate wheat, which we were actually moving around uh, Earth, let's say, and we, don't have, we haven't established settlements, human settlements. We were just collecting food. But when we started to develop agriculture, it's when we started to build our cities somehow. And that's pretty significant uh, when you think about what could be the future of society when uh, we start to have a digital content that somehow before was centralized, now is distribute, distributed and ubiquitous. What happens when we take that to the ability of produce physically things? If we bring this ubiquity to the ability of produce things, then uh, we are not attached anymore to be somewhere at a certain specific time. And I think that it's interesting because uh, without agreeing with Usman, I think we're, we're, we're putting our, our, our some of the same questions. So what, what is the next society? If we are now in the algorithm society, what is the next society we want? Which is, which is the, the, you know, the, the design decisions that we're going to make in order to construct what we want to happen in the near future. Um, I'm going to talk about, um, um, uh, through some projects uh, uh, um, that somehow serve as a reference in this idea of understanding uh, the, you know, the the different scales of data, the different scales of, of, of capturing data, and also the digital interactions, which I, I'm pretty interested in bringing, uh, first of all, as with reference projects like the Cyber, Cyber Scene project. You know, anyone in the room knows this project? Uh, it was recently brought uh, back to life by our friends in, in Fab Lab Santiago in the London Design Biennale, which is ba was basically a large, uh, uh, I would say, big data uh, infrastructure that the government of Chile was aiming to create in the 70s, when Chile was uh, somehow blocked 
being a socialist uh, country, uh, and it was trying to map out all its resources and trying to control it by uh, a, a, you know, a, a cybernetic system. And we're talking about 50 years ago uh, in, a, in a South American country in the corner of the world. No? Um, also, uh, uh, anyone knows El Paquete? No, El Paquete is a, I, I, I went to Cuba this year and I was fascinated by the El Paquete because it's actually, you know, uh, uh, there is a blockage of internet in Cuba, but actually El Paquete is an update of the internet that happens weekly in the island. So someone uh, um, uh, try, manages to bring in a hard drive, which is a terabyte. Everybody knows that El Paquete is a terabyte of information. And it sneaks in the, the, ter the, the hard drive in the island and then starts to circulate uh, 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 hand by hand, physically. So you see these guys bringing their uh, USB drives to, to have parts of El Paquete. And what is interesting is in, 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 uh, every time someone copies El Paquete and pass it to the next person, actually you pay every time it passes, some people start to add, as you see, the Cosmo this down here is actually next to the Cosmopolitan magazine that you can download it. You have some local advertisement of how to make uh, uh, from some tailor that could make the dresses for your, for your daughter for the 15-year uh, um, celebration. No? And you have like Netflix and everything all updated every week in El Paquete. And also what is interesting is that it more or less take, it's a week because it more or less takes a week for, from going to Havana to uh, Guantanamo, which is in the, is in the east part of the, of, of the island. No? So basically, you could see the latest update of Netflix probably in Guantanamo on Friday or Saturday every week if the paquete comes on Monday. So um, this, uh, uh, this starts to bring me uh, uh, also questions, and, and uh, again, recommending uh, other, uh, or putting again other reference is, uh, is this publication and work uh, called The Human Face of Big Data which actually starts to question the, uh, which are the implications behind all these interactions with devices and also or with this new infrastructure that we're using as the internet somehow, no? And I did, a, you know, based on uh, referencing on this work, I did an experiment, uh, I don't know if you have done it, it's called Data Selfie. Uh, it's, a, it's an add-on that you can put in your, in your Chrome browser and you can start to see how using the same uh, principles of a Cambridge Analytics algorithm, which is a company that actually um, change the trend, the trend of the U.S. elections. Uh, you can start. You, you allow the the the, the plugin to scrap your Facebook data, and this is my data selfie from today. I'm supposed to be no. I don't have a religious orientation. I'm a liberal, uh, and um, I think I tend. Yeah, you can see some of the other things. I, I, don't, I, I don't want to be so into that. Like, I, I, I'm, I'm supposed to be intelligent and be satisfied with about my life. <laughs> So, uh, based on this, I think that like, a lot of, uh, of, of, of the work uh, um, that um, I have been developing uh, during this year, the, this last year, is also about the idea of, of how much of this, this data we produce consciously, and how somehow we can enable the production of data uh, uh, through different platforms, and pretty much inspired, uh, and I want to mention again, by the, uh, by the work of Usman, and I, I used to say that we, we we could develop smart citizen because you sold Pachuve to someone else. So uh, it's smart citizen also has another tie with, with, um, with smart geometry uh, um, because uh, back in, in 2011 in Copenhagen, we developed the very, like, a, a, I would say, alpha version of, of the urban sensor kit. Uh, we call it by that, like that but, uh, by that time with Luis Fragua and Felipe Pesegueiro, but that somehow was um, an initial trigger to further develop a, a, a sensor device, a low-cost sensor device, uh, open source, uh, that somehow anyone could use, we assume that, and, and, and if, if, um, that would al allow anyone to consciously produce data and exchange it and, and share it with the world. No? At, the, at the beginning of, of a smart system, we were using Pachube, and then um, actually we had to build our own infrastructure after uh, it didn't work anymore when it was part of LogMeIn. So um, we crowdfunded the project also, which was uh, part of the, you know, the manifesto of the project. If it's a citizen sensor, it should be funded by citizens. And we managed to collect $68,000 in Kickstarter by, that, by Kickstarter by that time. And what we did was actually um, develop, a, a, for us, a very sexy circuit board, white. And we were very, like, a, attracted by that fact that, that, that could actually, it, it was, it's an Arduino on steroids, and, and that could uh, capture and transmit data about the environment, you know, air quality and noise pollution, light, humidity, and so on. And, and 
in the early deployments, we, we managed to put out, out there uh, like a 1,200 sensors uh, almost in every corner in the world. But we, I will tell you what we start to find out. But so this was a, more than a sensor, it was an ecosystem, no? which uh, was the physical asset as a sensor, uh, the, the, the representation, the digital representation of the data that the sensor was capturing, and also a, a, a digital infrastructure that would allow anyone to build on top of that data that was being collected by sensors. And of course, a documented API uh, that third parties could use to develop their own applications using the sensor, and it's still working. Um, and, and what we managed to do, which was totally unexpected, uh, is that uh, to continue the, the work on, on the smart cities and bands based on uh, European research funds. This was a project that if we would be in America, we would be turned into a startup and then sold to someone else and, and blah, blah, blah. But, uh, due to the, the characteristics of, 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 or the context where we are, we took the project into uh, research, basically. And we are collaborate, collaborating with these uh, projects in which we are funding different parts of a, of a smart cities. And so we, ha we managed to uh, somehow piggyback on all of, all of these projects to keep developing our own project. No? Um, but the thing is that uh, even if we had a very sexy, um, a very sexy sensor kit and electronic board and with a 3D printed case uh, and also with a well-documented API, we start to realize that people were not using the sensors, right? So uh, that idea that you know, uh, technology may, may more or less has the, is, 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 the, is the question, is the answer, so, uh, sorry, um, was, actually, you know, uh, was actually failing. And, and back in um, a couple of years, uh, a few years ago, I was part of a PhD program with Intel and in UCL. Uh, I, I dropped out, I didn't finish my PhD, but uh, actually I learned a lot, uh, for instance, of that, uh, not doing a PhD. And then uh, I, um, uh, also we, we could go deeper and deeper into issues around uh, the smart cities and projects and which, are the, which were the failures. So we, we published a, bun a bunch of papers together with my colleague Mara Balestrini and also uh, uh, supervised by Yvonne Rogers on uh, the different aspects that we found by studying different deployments that we made in Barcelona, Amsterdam, and Manchester with the sensors. No? So we, we started to see that people uh, needed uh, somehow, it sounds obvious, but when you start to look the, uh, you know, the closer to it, uh, you realize that you know, some of the people that we interviewed in these deployments were motivated to participate because they were excited, they were geeks somehow, they were excited about the technology, they would get the sensor, they would test it, and they would put it in a drawer. No? Um, for instance, uh, the other people, there were other group of people that would think that the sensors were magic, and then would just like, uh, you know, turn it in and start to work. And the technology somehow needed some hacking and some probably co commenting some code and so on, so that was a, a significant flaw for disengaged people into participate, no? The other is uh, the data reliability, and especially in the air quality sensors, that's a big issue. I don't know if some of you have been playing with air quality, it's a pain in the ass, uh, especially when you use low cost sensors, uh, especially metal oxide sensors, no? So um, somehow people wanted to see the, re the reflection of reality in the data, and was, it was not the case, especially in, in air quality. Then you need to foster social interactions between people because people would feel alone. If you have just a sensor by yourself, it would help for people to come together to a makerspace, to a fab lab, to a community space, in order to discuss what is happening with their sensors and share it with the other people. And, fin and finally, having, you know, making the, the use of the sensor meaningful. And, and, and when we talk about rewards here, it's not talking about paying people to keep the sensor, but actually looking at how the sensor would, would, would make a significant transformation in, in their reality. You know? So we, had, uh, we are lucky because we did this uh, research before we were awarded with this project, which is called Making Sense, in which we uh, started to design and test uh, new forms of engagement of citizens. And sometimes it was as silly as developing an on onboarding tool, uh, an interactive tool that will let people step by step, uh, even like, uh, you know, people would ask, where is the battery? What is a battery? What is the plug? Uh, uh, on and off switch and so on, we need to follow each one of single step in order to allow people to successfully uh, set up their sensors. And, and we did that uh, basically as, a, as an add-on of our existing platform and that we tested in a, in a deployment that we did in a, in a plaza in Gracia, uh, in the neighborhood of Gracia in Barcelona. 
in which uh, we work first of creating a set of community champions and then with the local association of neighbors in order to understand which were the issues that, we were, that they thought w um, they would need the smart city center for. And they understood that, or, or they knew actually for 20 years, that the noise pollution was a big issue in the plaza. Uh, for more than 20 years, uh, people was, has been allowed to drink. It, again, it sounds uh, pretty obvious, but they were allowed to drink in the plaza and then by 10, 12 p.m. in the night, people were uh, passing the, um, the, the normative uh, in, the, in the decibels um, permitted by the European Union. So what this group of citizens managed to do, articulated with a team that would support them and with a technology, is actually led to the transformation of a public space. And right now, the City Council has opened a participatory process to redesign the entire plaza in order to respond to the issues that the neighbors identified by using not only the technology, but also the methods, uh, uh, the engagement methods that we develop, developed uh, using the, the smart citizen technology. Um, so another uh, component of the, of the project is that other people has been built on top of it, uh, different applications, or is using somehow the infrastructure for something else. It's, this is the case of the open source Beehives uh, project that has been successfully crowdfunded. Uh, uh, a few weeks ago, and now it's developing sensors that go inside the beehives uh, that will allow the monitoring of the colonies of bees that has been affected by the colony collapse disorder. If you haven't heard about it, you should research on that because bees are responsible for 30% of the food that we eat, and they are disappearing based with, no, they, they haven't, they have, it's not a specific uh, Costs uh, identified yet, but what we are going, what, what we want to do with the with this approach with the open source beehives is to open a, a massive open science uh, uh, research project around the world. Then another project that is also building on top of the smart citizen technologies and uh, Aqua Pioneers, also crowd, uh, successfully su successfully crowdfunded and also incubated in our lab, that uh, is somehow developing a, a low water consumption low soil usage uh, um, 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 cultivation uh, systems uh, using the aquaponics uh, uh, principles, which is basically feeding your plants with the poo of your fish, okay? And then the, the plants kill, uh, uh, somehow clean the water of the fish and it creates like a closed loop. So those are some of the enabling technologies that we have been working with and, 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 and we keep continue develop uh, the, the Smart Citizen and we are about to launch a second version uh, this fall. So I want to jump uh, somehow and, 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 and come back with the idea of uh, this, uh, you know, going from the digital to the physical realm and re in understanding how this new uh, mediation between technology and people, especially with digital fabrication technologies, uh, can make us think in a new way of organizing the urban environment somehow, no? Um, this not only about thinking about the people is gonna print in their houses, everything, or Fab Labs are going to replace industry, but somehow we are probably in the verge of a new way of bringing back, bringing back, back production to the city. No? And the tools that you are using now somehow in the, um, um, to do experimental design and experimental architecture uh, are, is, are tools that come from the industry somehow. Um, and one of the things that we are researching deeply is trying to understand how these this indust industrial tools can be more humanized somehow and can be closer to people, and how we can start to think about a complementary ecosystem of production in the city that goes from the 3D printer in your house to your, to your fab lab in your neighborhood, probably to your flexible factory in your city and large uh, uh, or the global supply chains. No? And that how it affects the creation of a new family of products and a new family of um, appliances, even uh, I, I imagine like a new family of home appliances are, will start to come that are going to be based on the local production of food, energy, and somehow the, um, I would say the optimization of resources, especially water. And one of my favorite projects is the one in the top middle, is the shower loop that reduces significantly the amount of water that you use when you, cons uh, when, when you take a shower. Uh, I think the future is not about having a sensor that will turn off the water when you have five minutes in the shower, but actually not having to think about the amount of water that you're consuming in the shower. It is, at least it's the future I want to live in. Uh, but um, these are projects that, you know, they might look like uh, uh, smartphones uh, 30 years ago, but somehow they're opening uh, a new way of understanding somehow the reorganization of global supply chains and, and somehow the distribution of resources. And this is what we are doing uh, in, the, in the Fab City project 
uh, which is thinking how cities are going to be uh, reconfigured when we are able to produce everything they consume locally. You know, with the idea of changing this um, kind of product in trash out pattern, meaning that cities import products and produce trash, so they are, they are big trash machines, uh, into a, a circular city somehow uh, um, that produce, keep atoms, uh, let's say, in the urban environment, and the only thing that tra is information or data. So this requires, uh, again, uh, a, a massive collaboration and a massive effort, for instance, on starting to develop systems in which we can understand how cities are progressing to reduce the amount of resources they consume externally. And we don't have an answer to that yet, and we are still researching on how, how to do that, but we imagine having cities producing data, exchanging that data globally, and being able to, de to, to, being able to co create commonly, uh, um, a common uh, city resilient index. No? And this is something that many people is doing, uh, uh, not only in, in, uh, in, in, in research institutions, even in large, um, large uh, consultancy companies like Deloitte or, or, or McKinsey, um, we could try to see how to use an open approach to this, basically uh, open, uh, open data uh, sources and also the platform itself to be open and, and available. And how to uh, implement this, actually we think on, on building on top of, uh, of existing FabLab network as, a, as an infrastructure, uh, connect them to, um, the, the, say, the capacity of cities to hold somehow a certain amount of power and this transition that we are seeing of cities accumulating more and more power of decision, they're closer to the citizens. And then uh, connecting this network, actually many people here, some people here in the room are already part of this approach of trying to uh, develop experimenta experimentation areas in different cities in the world that will, al will allow us to test this uh, uh, new approach to local production. No? So how we go from the, uh, from the theoretical approach, from the, you know, from the pure visionary approach of allowing cities to produce everything to and start to work uh, uh, operationally of making it happen. And how we can use existing infrastructure, as I said, fab labs or maker spaces, as these cat cat catalysts of this transformation of the urban environment or the, or the urban living. No? This is a project that uh, we did last year with IKEA. This is the kind of partners uh, or the scale of partners that we're working with in which we brought IKEA designers to the, the Poblenou district in Barcelona uh, um, in an experiment in which they, they had to collect the furniture they designed to be trashed very quickly, uh, collect that furniture and reinsert it into, into the, the existing infrastructure for production that was in the, in the, in the, in the neighborhood because we don't only have fab labs but had other type of fabrication spaces and, and, and try uh, and somehow experimenting a, a new way of, of, of or a, a possible future business of IKEA, which is moving from just having warehouses outside the cities that make the clients part of their, of their assembly line. So when you buy an IKEA, you actually become a worker of IKEA because you're part of the assembly line of IKEA. You put, you put together your own uh, furniture and start to think about IKEA having flexible factories inside the neighborhoods in which they produce on demand uh, products that you design from your living room somehow and use local, mat local materials. And I don't know if you have seen, but, but after this experiment, IKEA started to open pop-up stores in Madrid, Barcelona, and London. They are now the, um, developing an, an augmented reality app that allows you to buy IKEA furniture from your living room and place it in, place, in, place it in, the, in, in your living room and deliver, and deliver it to your house, um, which somehow show that they are able to react quickly, um, even though that you're not in the, in the path that we imagine. No? So, this was the, uh, is the main again, made again challenge. We have more of that published online. Uh, so um, I'm going to go, f um, I'm getting to an end uh, in which I think that you know, design processes are going to be dramatically transformed if we see this uh, uh, somehow the expansion of, of digital technologies uh, at scale somehow and we move from the little plastic 3D printing machine to understanding larger ecosystems of production when they are back to the city, and when we have a larger engagement from um, not only from the, the, the DIY community, but actually the research community and trying to implement processes for this to happen. No? Um, this is uh, some of our approaches, uh, you know, I, I showed before, are based on these multiscalar strategies uh, that we are um, somehow starting to draft 
into a, into a research program that I started with my colleague in uh, at the Royal College of Arts, uh, my colleague James Toos at the Royal College of Arts uh, Design Products Program, where we started to somehow put in one of the most traditional schools in, in the pure industrial design new questions around what's the role of design in this future that is coming, no? in, this, in, the, in, the, in the age of distribution somehow. No? And I put a, a reference to Black Mirror. Uh, I, I, I don't know if you have, uh, have seen the TV show, but I like the, uh, one of the things I like very much about Black Mirror is that it shows you uh, speculations that you think are possible somehow. No? So you, you are seeing future speculations that are not merely a speculative design that shows some dystopia or utopias, but actually shows the speculations that you start to believe. Uh, so I, I, the exercise that we do with our students is to build these speculations, but from the positive point of view, somehow, a slightly different than that in, that in Black Mirror. So with that, I'm going to finish very quickly uh, with a very quick pass. I think I, I'm about to finish um, with uh, the... Uh, the reference to, to the text I wrote in the proceedings for this conference, uh, which I named the seven reflections on technology, politics, society, and economy, uh, I, I felt that was the only way to somehow show uh, uh, part of the reflections that come out of this work uh, we have been developing during the last uh, 10 years. Also, it shows the, the over, how overwhelmed uh, I am about what, what's happening, and I am, uh, in, in which you know, it's difficult to say which, which type of city we live today, no? You know, we, we used to call it smart city or previously the sustainable city, and, and now the, uh, the, 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 the many names that we have put to the city through history, through history is somehow showing us that somehow we can think about like every person is a city or every organ in the city is a city, no? So um, another reflection is about the idea of monocultivation and somehow refers, again, to the agrarian uh, society in this idea of, of we have been putting we are putting a lot of efforts of cultivating something as abstract as money and, and somehow compromising everything else on behalf of the cultivation of money of the of the pure market economical profits uh, and the interesting thing is that um, you know the we are actually this month uh, it's uh, we celebrate the 150 years anniversary of the capital of Marx uh, if you didn't know. And, and somehow we are replicating a system, the economic system, but now with new, new type of infrastructure, new type of means, as I was explaining before. The other thing is like a, we live in a huge paradox. Even if I'm talking about all these things and have a huge uh, kind of um, uh, ethical uh, content, I'm, I'm doing it from a, Mac computer, from a Mac computer using Nike shoes, which are based uh, uh, somehow in the same problems that I'm talking about. No? So we are somehow trapped in this uh, paradox uh, uh, as we are now, in, we, don't, we somehow don't know how to get out. Uh, so I'm interested in looking at ways to get out. Um, in a way also I think that um, we have been trying to picture many different futures and somehow we have been living the future for the last uh, 100 years. So a lot of the philosophical questions that we're making ourselves today uh, have been made, for instance, by people at the beginning of the last century. I mentioned that before. Uh, if you haven't seen uh, or you haven't checked Otto Neurath, I think you should, uh, uh, especially the man in the making uh, publication. But, but Otto Neurath is, a, is the father of the isotype. Is actually you know which toilet to go thanks to not Otto Neurath, for instance. And then the question um, of, of, of what, which are the things that are showing us somehow a positive or, or a, a positive trend in, 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 in the change of things how they are. Now, even if we're trapping this paradox, I think that we have seen the emergence of, of cryptocurrencies and the blockchains as a new form of organizing the economy or our financial, financial system, which still causes some kind of uh, skepticism. Uh, but uh, I think that that's, that's, that's good news that the, I think the, uh, um, one of the main bankers in the world last week was claiming, uh, from JP Morgan, was claiming that uh, uh, Bitcoin was a fraud. So that's a good sign, uh, I think. No? And, 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 and finally, I think that uh, one of the, you know, the main questions uh, around technology, I don't think uh, that are any more um, you know, about which are the new means of technology, the, the new trend. No? We, are, we have seen how you know, uh, CNC technologies uh, have been appropriated by the design processes, then 
we have 3D printing, then we have robotics, now augmented reality, drones, uh, virtual reality, HoloLens, and so on and so on. But actually, I think there are deeper questions on how we use those technologies, not only to prove that we can use them and master them, but actually how we can give them a purpose, how we can give them meaning, and, and, some, and also how we distribute them and how we uh, design the ownership models to make them more accessible. So I think that with that, I finish uh, my intervention. Thank you. Thank you.